National Broadcasting Company. That sound is heard more often by more people than any other sound in America. Pulsing out from the transmitter tower into the tubes and coils behind your radio dial, whoever, wherever you may be. It's like a welcome knock on the door and the sound of the familiar voice of an old friend. The welcome voice of NBC speaks many languages, music, the crosstalk of forum and discussion. It speaks the clipped and colorful lingo of sport, the many hundred tongues and tones of drama. It speaks the language of laughter, the rippling idiom of comedy. And it tells the world of how the world spins with the voice of truth. These are voices of NBC today, versatile and modulated. But do you remember more than 20 years ago when radio was learning to talk? Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes defended the Harding administration course on the League of Nations today when asked whether it wasn't time for the Republican Party to give the people an unequivocal statement in regard to its position on the world court. He denied that the its United voice States was a whisper crackling with static, and you stayed up till three, scratching a crystal with a wire cat whisker to log Pittsburgh, 50 miles away. And then radio moved up from the cellar to the parlor, its earphones replaced by a handsome cone speaker, big enough for Dad to get his whole head in as he still tried for distance. Maybe Cincinnati direct on a clear evening. But it was a magic night late in 1926 when Dad switched to his local station and found that it was linked by telephone lines to 19 other stations to form the National Broadcasting Company. The creation of this pioneer network meant that a broadcast originating from any of these affiliated stations could be heard clearly in the area served by all the others and always at the same spot on Dad's side. Now radio was going places and NBC went with it extending its network from coast to coast, spanning the nation to bring the on-the-spot play-by-play report of Graham McNamee describing the doings in Pasadena's Sunny Rose Bowl to winterbound listeners in New York. But millions of widely separated people were still to be turned into next-door neighbors. And so the cross-continental chain became a permanent web and the web was woven into a fabric, and the fabric covers the nation, reaches up into Canada, across the Pacific, America's number one network, more than 170 stations, independent community stations, of which only six are owned and operated by NBC. But to affiliates and key stations alike, the industry's focal point is in Radio City, the city within a city. Here at New York's Rockefeller Center is home site and hearth side for the NBC family. And here the welcome mat is laid out for over half a million visitors a year. Friends from all over the world who've dropped in to see what goes on behind their radio dial. The NBC guides would have to be graduate engineers to answer all the questions that people ask on our regular tours about how a radio show is actually put on the air. That was a simpler story in the old days when this antique master control desk took only one man to operate. 
But today, it requires a whole team to man the panel board. From this room, programs all around the clock are routed over 16,000 miles of leased telephone lines to radio stations all over the nation. This is the nerve center of NBC. You know, what you hear on the air represents only a fraction of the effort that goes into network radio. The microphone doesn't pick up, for example, the sound of the teletypes in the communications department, which connect our key cities and handle the 3,000 messages a day which are necessary to bring your shows in on cue. You can't tune in on the traffic department either, but without it, no telling what you'd get. For on this board, every minute of the broadcast day is programmed weeks in advance to be constantly checked and rechecked for split-second transmission to the proper station. Our guests naturally always want to see some of the voices that they hear every day at home. So they usually stop in on a rehearsal studio. Here, behind a soundproof window, they can eavesdrop on a popular daytime serial, getting a final run-through before airtime. Thank you, Mary. Do you want me to stay, Doctor? No, it won't be necessary, thank you, Mary. Yes, Doctor. Sit down, Mrs. Everett, please. Well, Doctor, Maybe you found out what's wrong with my husband. Maybe you can tell me about him. All those other doctors. Uh, Gertrude, that's yeah. well. I liked your, uh, your entry line. It was flat and it's good characterization. Now, I want to get two emotions in this last uh, speech of yours. Uh, I want to feel on that line where you sit down that you're more nervous about anything about yourself. Oh, most people generally are. And also on the other line in that, in that little sentence there, make sure. But I have the feeling that you are concerned about your husband's health. It's very serious. Oh, I Is see. Is that fair? Yes, I see. That's all two of them in that sense. All right, let's run that scene again from page 83. In the doctor's line, sit down, Mrs. Everett, please. On two lines. All right. Sit down, Mrs. Everett. I guess people are more current events conscious these days because they always want to see the NBC newsroom. Maybe catch a glimpse of the dean of commentators, Mr. Calkenborn. And that's the news picture as it looks in post-war Europe tonight. Confused enough to be sure, but certainly not altogether hopeless. Good night. Well, I've just helped turn another day over to history. But history has no clocks and has no calendars. And that's why NBC has provided a room where history can be recorded eternally. That's the newsroom. Let's visit it for a bit, shall we? All night and all day, every day in the year, these machines bring the world's news to NBC for processing. A bell signal will indicate that a really hot news story is on the wire. Usually, they just Tick away the ordinary everyday facts about the daily doings of humanity. Scarcely pausing between stories on the national debt, the international crisis, and the national league. It is our job here to sift these facts, to analyze and evaluate them, bring them into focus with their background, and turn them into stories for radio's newspaper. The only newspaper which is perpetually going to press. Radio's magnificent job of reporting the news is a matter of record. Very little of note has occurred in the last 20 years that hasn't cut a groove in the wax of NBC's permanent transcription files. Radio is not just a thing of the moment, reserved for all time in its archives, are the sounds, the words, that history made and spoke as they happened, while it was actually happening. And there's the Winnie Mae now, winging her way in with a new world's record. Around the world in the record time of eight days, 15 hours and 15 minutes. The crowd's rushing out on the field to meet the ship as it taxis up the runway. And from where I am, I can't see Getty, but that looks like Wiley Post now, getting out of the plane. 
I've got the NBC microphone through this crowd, and it's just a... Wiley, will you and Harold... Still now, they've dropped rope out of the nose of the ship, and uh, the passenger probably is lining the window looking down. The first and the plane. Wait, get this started, get this started. It's right, and it's right, it's right, it's terrible. If I am elected president of the United States, with confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. From this room, NBC sent you its reports, hour by hour, and sometimes even minute by minute, on the greatest news story of all time, the Second World War. It followed the news wherever it went and sent back eyewitness accounts, the tide of global battle, sent back the actual sound made by a world coming apart at the scene. And so today, NBC News and special events, mindful of its obligation to keep America informed, has enlarged its facilities so that everyone, in sound of a radio, has his ear to the ground. It is not intended to suspend the decision of the Security Council by an understanding that these answers have to be in before we act. If you look closely enough behind your radio dial, you would inevitably find people. At NBC, important people. In the mailroom, for instance, the clerks who handle the thousands of letters you write into us every day. More letters than are received in many a good-sized post office. And the people in the information department who see to it that every letter is answered. For modern network radio is more than just a man with a microphone. It is a thousand men and women performing tasks without which your receiver would be just a silent piece of furniture. Yes, radio is people. Everyone from the man who tells you who's in Studio 8H to the men who make a living slamming doors and breaking dishes. Radio is also the anonymous standby pianist who on a moment's notice must fill an emergency silence with music. And it's the director, the producer, and the composer too. People whose voices are never heard on the air but who have made NBC's music department the finest in the radio industry. A mass of specialized detail goes into the preparation of a musical program. Every selection must first be investigated for clearance and performance rights. When the numbers have been cleared for broadcast, some are turned over to the composing staff and special arrangements are prepared. The balance of the program may come from orchestrations on file at NBC, the largest and most complete working music library in the world, containing everything from swing to symphony. Rehearsal for the Fred Waring Show. And the talent of the singer is deftly woven into the pattern of the program. It takes many hours of patient practice to tailor the artistic and technical quality of every note transmitted to your loudspeaker. Rehearsing, revising, rewriting, time to the relentless sweep hand of the stopwatch. Finally, they're on the air. Fred Waring and the Pennsylvanians broadcasting today from Radio City in New York. And here to greet you on this nice Thursday is your host, Fred Waring. Hello, everybody, and thanks for coming.
NBC New York is also the eastern terminus of radio's most famous thoroughfare, Allen's Alley. Tell me, Mr. Moody, what are your feelings about the radio? I don't hold with furniture that talks. Well, you, you have a radio. Well, I had one in the hen house. Yeah? One day, all the hen's nest would be empty. Uh-huh. Next day, every nest would have two eggs into it. You mean? The hens were listening to double or nothing. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Co-capital of world entertainment is NBC's Western Radio City in Hollywood. The names they write in autograph books outside NBC Hollywood are those of the greatest stars in radio and the most in demand for advertising sponsorship. Got to hurry and pack. We'll travel light. It's a thing to do these days. Where are the suitcases? Right here in the hall across. The money that advertisers spend to sponsor these shows pays for other programs, too. Non-commercial broadcasts in the public service account for more than 40% of NBC's scheduled time. The network makes free time available for roundtable discussion and farm and home programs. It provides regular facilities, free and impartially, to the three major faiths. And it divides the air fairly and without cost, so that the voices of labor, management, and agriculture can all be heard. But neither network nor sponsors ultimately decide what you shall hear. To determine the most popular types of radio entertainment, NBC engages in constant research by telephone. Hello? This is the program rating service. We are conducting a survey of radio listeners. Were you listening to your radio just now? To what program were you listening, please? By careful attendance to the wishes expressed in letters sent in by listeners all over the world. By carefully worked out scientific tests. Ladies and gentlemen, we have invited you here to participate in testing a proposed radio program. We want you to register your approval or disapproval at various points in the program on those reaction sheets that you hold. As the light flashes on the screen, please let us know how you feel about the program by checking either good or fair or poor alongside the corresponding number on your reaction sheet. And by direct contact. A pro- so kind of a program you recommend for your child or your grandchildren. Amusing. Amusing. Interesting to the children. Entertaining program. I think that was very nice for children. I don't believe that there's a great many grown-ups would care to listen to it. How did you feel? You've heard these older folks say oh, it's a good program for youngsters. How do you feel being a youngster? Well, it was boring at first, but then it got a little interesting as it went on in history. All right, you feel perhaps the program childish. is a little childish. That's right. NBC's obligation to its listeners is founded on its basic respect for the American home. All material for the microphone is examined in the light of a zealously guarded code. The ordinary standards of good taste, public conscience, incorporated into the network's program policy. For NBC knows that vigilance is the price that radio must pay for its stewardship of the air. It knows that responsibility is the first obligation of freedom. of every American to turn the switch on his radio and listen without a license to what he pleases when he pleases and to pay no tribute for what he hears was guaranteed by the Constitution more than a hundred years before the first practical sputter was ever coaxed out of the electromagnetic wave. The freedom of the air in America is inalienable. To extend this American freedom into new and uncharted wavelengths, NBC, in 1941, established the first commercial television station in the country, began immediately to expand it into a network. Adding sight to sound, it opened an electronic window, rang up the magic curtain, and ushered you to the first row, to the best seat in the house, your own easy chair. More than two decades of NBC radio have been dedicated to the spirit of public service. Now, in bringing television, network television, out of the laboratory and into your living room, NBC rededicates itself in this same spirit 
to provide the greatest medium of mass information and mass entertainment in the world. of yesterday's radio is the crystal ball of television in which is visible a whole new era of communication. In one generation, boys and vision have transcended space. Science, engineering, and organization have harnessed the ratio between light and sound so that radio or television, if you look behind your dial that is set at NBC, you will find that you are tuned in on today and focus on tomorrow.